a group of explorers who disappeared in the Ural Mountains. Spaceships capable of generating beams of light visible from various cities in northeastern Europe. An alien being who lands on Earth, showing himself to a group of children. These mysterious events beyond the Iron Curtain of the Soviet Union have raised doubts and questions about the intentions of extraterrestrials, but they also make us reflect on how much the human mind and the power of imagination can create new and compelling stories just for the sake of feeling part of an era. There was once a nation that stretched from the great plains of Central Europe to the shores of the Pacific Ocean, a giant called the Soviet Union, where a myriad of different ethnicities and cultures, hundreds of millions of people, lived in a communist society that was the child of a proletarian revolution that ended the Russia of the Tsars. At the dawn of the 20th century, Russia was a great imperialist and nationalist power, not unlike other European nations, such as Great Britain, France, Germany, Austria, Hungary and Italy. Countries which between the 19th and early 20th centuries laid the foundations for the development of new ideologies, technologies and social schemes. And so, in 1917, the October Revolution took place, which, led by Vladimir Lenin, brought the Bolsheviks to power, establishing the first communist society on the face of planet Earth. It wouldn't be many years before this would-be socialist utopia transformed into a totalitarian state under the leadership of Joseph Stalin. It was 1945 when the United States of America and the Soviet Union, as allies, won the war against Germany, thus becoming, by right, the two superpowers able, in the years to come, to contend for world supremacy. The Americans in this period were the spokesmen of a growing and flourishing capitalist ideology, which denoted characteristics exactly opposite to the communist ideology of the Soviets. For this reason, a climate of contention was established, generating a new conflict called the Cold War. This new war was denominated cold because large-scale conflicts were never created. Instead, it generated a strategic race to obtain ideological and geopolitical dominance over the whole world through the development and race for arms, space and new technologies. From here, however, the Soviet Union established a climate of closure towards the world and through the heavy hand of the dictatorship, not only were people no longer able to leave the imaginary line of territorial borders, but also military secrets were kept until the fall of the USSR in the 90s. The question arises, in a territory so vast that it borders Poland to the east and Korea to the west, how many secrets could have been forgotten in almost 50 years? Those that we are going to tell you about today are just some of the most striking stories concerning the activity of mysterious space beings in the territory of the former Soviet Union. The Dyatlov Pass Incident It is January the 25th, 1959. A group of hikers decide to set off on an expedition across the northern Urals, an imposing mountain range that divides European Russia from Asia. Despite the freezing temperatures and harsh weather conditions that usually characterize these mountain peaks during the winter, ten young people, including eight young men and two women, formed a group to undertake a cross-country skiing trip on Mount Orktorten in Sviedlovsk Oblast. Most of them, some of them students at the Ural Polytechnic Institute, were aged between 21 and 24, and the expedition leader, Igor Alexievich Dyatlov was just 23 years old. Although the route to be tackled was considered Category 3, that is, very dangerous, especially in that period of the year, the group could boast of excellent knowledge of both long ski excursions and mountain exploration and climbing. Therefore, they began their journey with the enthusiastic spirit of those who are capable of tackling this type of enterprise. 
Their adventure began when they arrived by train in the town of Ivdiel, to then continue on board a truck to Visage, the last inhabited settlement at the foot of the mountain range. A few days later, on January the 27th, they began the long march towards their longed-for destination, albeit with an unexpected event. In fact, the next day a member of the group, Yurish Yudan, was forced to abandon the trip due to health problems. The other nine continued. The climb to the summit continued inexorably, even as temperatures dropped slowly but drastically, reaching below minus 20 degrees Fahrenheit. In the days that followed, the group continued their adventure without facing much difficulty, even managing to document the evolution of their journey through their daily diaries and taking photos with their cameras. For four long days, the group trekked along wild paths beaten by the wind and snow, yet an atmosphere of excitement pervaded them. Finally they had made it, they were there, free to admire those majestic landscapes, so far away from any man-made comforts. In her personal diary, the young Zinaida Kolmogorova found time to think and write. I wonder what awaits us on this expedition. Who knows if we will experience something never seen before. On February the 1st, after having spent the whole day climbing the mountain, the group of hikers managed to reach the eastern side, and exhausted by their intense day, they decided to camp for the night by setting up their tents a few hundred meters from the summit of Koilat Sakil, a name that in the language of the Mansi, or the indigenous population who inhabit the area, means Dead Mountain. But from that day, news from the group stopped arriving. On February the 12th, Dyatlov and his companions should have returned to Visage, but this didn't happen that day, nor on the following days. The silence from the group of young trekkers became more and more intense. For days there was no sign of people returning from the peaks of the Urals. So the family members, tormented by a sense of apprehension and triggered by the thought that the group could be in danger, managed to organise a rescue team made up of volunteer students and professors from the institute, thanks also to enormous pressure on the director of the Polytechnic. And on February the 20th, the search parties began. The police and army soon joined them, using helicopters and airplanes to quickly scour the mountain range. For days and days, the searches gave no results. It seemed as if the mountain had swallowed the group up, and to make matters worse, the continuous snowstorms inexorably slowed down the activities of the search parties. Finally, on February the 26th, there was a breakthrough. The volunteers finally managed to find the camp of the expedition. With discouragement and a slight sense of dismay, what appeared before their eyes made them immediately doubt that the young hikers could still be alive. Something terrible had happened along that mountain ridge. The tents were torn to shreds, some lay on the ground, others dismantled in a disorderly manner, as well as being covered by a copious layer of snow, while personal items and equipment were eerily in order. There were meticulously folded clothes and boots placed next to the sleeping bags, as if the group were about to go to sleep before disappearing into thin air. But there was no trace of human presence. The strangest aspect noticed later by the rescuers was that the fabric of the tents seemed to have been torn from inside with knives or a sharp object, as if the group had been surprised by something or someone who had forced them to flee in a hurry in the middle of the night, without taking the due precautions to survive at a temperature well below zero. But what could have caused them to flee in this manner? As a first observation, the rescuers assumed an avalanche or a bear attack. However, before answering this question with certainty, it was necessary to find the survivors, or in the worst case, their bodies. A series of footprints could be followed leading from the tents that led into the woods just over a mile away to the east, 
which then disappeared into thin air after about 500 meters, as if the man or woman who had left them had disappeared from one moment to the next. A patrol then continued the search precisely towards the northeast, and it was here, on the border with the forest, that they found the remains of a fire under a large cedar tree, and where just a few meters away, the corpses of two of the hikers lay under the snow. Yuri Krivoneshenko and Yurij Dorosenko, aged 23 and 21, respectively. They were both barefoot and dressed only in undergarments. They had tried to light a fire so as not to freeze to death, but unfortunately, their efforts were in vain. The cedar tree had also been damaged, its branches were broken, and there was blood on the bark. This led the patrol to think that the two hikers had climbed in a hurry to protect themselves from something. But what? It took two long months of searching before the remaining seven hikers were found. Three of the group were found a few miles away from where they had pitched their tents on the night of February the 1st. They were wearing boots and jackets, but nothing to keep them warm in the extreme minus 22 degrees. They were all found in the same position, lying on their stomachs, with their heads facing the direction of the camp. Finally, the last four were found, 75 meters away from the camp, under about three meters of snow. Three of them had fatal injuries. The first had a fractured skull, while the other two had a large number of broken ribs, which caused massive internal bleeding, leading to death. However, during the autopsy, the doctors reported that injuries like those could only be conceivable in the event of a fall from a great height or following a car accident, and said that these fatal injuries were inflicted while the hikers were still alive, but the injuries were not attributable to a possible attack by a human. But the strange anomalies do not end here. Two of the hikers were found without eyeballs, an expression of pure terror on their faces, while one of the girls was completely missing her tongue, as if it had been surgically amputated. The fourth member of the group was later found with a broken nose and a strangely swollen and deformed neck. However, the autopsy confirmed his death was caused by hypothermia. Violent, terrifying and unexplained deaths at the top of a mountain pass, which the natives call Dead Mountain. As if this weren't enough to be the perfect setting for a horror film, another detail is then added to the story, perhaps the most disturbing of all. Some of the clothes found at the camp were analysed by experts and an abnormal amount of radiation was found in the fabric. No one was able to shed light on what had really happened to the nine hikers. And in May 1959, the forensics team terminated the investigations, while the chief of the investigations reported the following. The cause of the deaths stems from an unknown force that the hikers were unable to overcome. In the years to come, the story of the nine hikers became famous throughout the Soviet Union and then spread all over the world after the fall of the Iron Curtain in 1990. The terrifying event that occurred on Dead Mountain became known to everybody as the Dyatlov Pass incident. But the question still remains, and the subject of discussion today is this. What prompted the group to leave their tents and run barefoot in the snow, even without warm clothes, with a temperature of minus 20 degrees? But above all, why did the damage to internal organs not match with wounds or bruises found on the skin? And why were their clothes radioactive? There are several theories about this, which are still debated today. The first speaks of an avalanche of ice that hit their tents and may have caused some of their injuries. However, the slope above the camp was not steep enough or high enough to produce a destructive avalanche capable of causing that much damage. Moreover, from the photographs taken by the search and rescue team, they show how the group's equipment was buried under a light layer of snow, 
exactly in the area where the Nine had pitched their tents. If an avalanche had actually hit that area, shoes, skis and other equipment would have been swept away by the wave of snow, or at least buried under a massive layer of snow, which did not happen. Another theory suggests an attack on a group of hikers by a local tribe of indigenous Mansi, but there was no reason for the Mansi to attack. And to make matters worse, discrediting this theory is the fact that none of the supplies or items were stolen from the site of the incident. Moreover, the nine young trekkers in the Dyatlov expedition were certainly not the first to make excursions in the Mansi territory. Dozens and dozens of group passed through these areas without ever encountering any problems with the Mansi tribes. A third theory speaks of a military test in the area. Nobody can say whether it was done intentionally or accidentally. The fact is that some believe that the Red Army tested an experimental weapon on the group, perhaps a missile or a biological weapon. This would explain the frenzy with which the group left the camp and could also explain the high amount of radiation found on their clothes. Yet why would the army do such a thing, going to test a weapon in a non-military area, when all over the Soviet Union there were thousands of square kilometers of military ranges and bases? There are also details that make one think further. Yuri, the young man who decided to abandon the expedition for health reasons, claimed that the group was in possession of a particular orange sphere of unknown origin and that their skin, when they were found, was strangely tanned and dark. Without forgetting the footprints that disappeared 500 meters east of the camp. How could there have been footprints, given that it snowed during those nights? It almost seems that someone returned to that cursed place to leave clues and only partially delete some of them probably to hide something and confuse those who were investigating. While the damage to the trees and the blood, on reflection, could be traces of a struggle, and the way in which the young people were injured recalls a sort of vengeful and methodical execution carried out with deep rancor and violence. Needless to specify how many other theories speak of yetis, snow monsters and evil spirits of the forest, However, there is a theory that we absolutely cannot exclude, that of an extremely superior alien force, which that night could have acted undisturbed. For this, we must take into consideration the photos taken during those winter days of 1959. For example, the roll of film taken from the camera of Alexandra Zolotaryev shows various anomalies in the sky above the mountains. What we can see are lights, or globular objects, that illuminate the night sky. This was not an isolated case. Blinding lights were seen not only by the Dyatlov group, but also by other inhabitants of that region of the Urals. In fact, during the period between January and February of 1959, three different people reported to authorities that they had noticed lights moving in the skies above those peaks. Is it possible that the group were being followed by these orbs of light, and if so, why is there no record of this happening in their journals and diaries? One explanation could be a cover-up, perpetrated by the army, which, once it took over the reins of the case, concluded it in great haste, not giving researchers time to analyse the incident in detail, and reaching confused, inconsistent and non-exhaustive conclusions. The diaries and cameras were immediately seized and taken to Moscow, while it remains curious that the Soviet government closed off the area of the incident for many years, preventing anyone from approaching the Dyatlov Pass. There is not much else to know, only over time we will find out if what happened can be rationally explained, or if forces not native to this planet came into play on that cold night of 1959. Either way, the terrible Dyatlov Pass incident remains one of the scariest mysteries of our times.
the Petrosavosked phenomenon. On the night of September the 20th, 1977, a series of celestial events of a controversial nature took place in the skies over the city of Petrozavodsk and beyond. Although the fulcrum of sightings was recorded in the city, they were reported from Denmark to Finland and up to west of Vladivostok on the Pacific coast of the Soviet Union, a vast territory. The phenomenon took its name from the city of Petrozavodsk, the capital of the Republic of Karelia in the then Soviet Union. The phenomenon was widely reported by the citizens, the sighting of a flying object which on the night of the 20th of September would have flooded the city with numerous and very powerful rays of light. The event's dimensions were so large that a few days later some government officials from Western European countries sent multiple and different letters to Anatoly Alexandrov, President of the USSR Academy of Sciences, expressing concern about the incident as it was believed that those strange globes of light could have been caused by new experimental weapons tests by the Soviet Union. Since 1977, many have tried to attribute the phenomenon to the launch of the Soviet satellite Cosmos 955. However, in the same year, a preliminary report was drafted containing a large body of visual observations, radio location reports, physical measurements, and accompanying meteorological data, and it concluded that, on the basis of the data available, it has not been possible to satisfactorily understand the observed phenomenon. The Petrosavodsk case even contributed to the creation of a Soviet research program for UFO phenomena called Sietka. For its realization, two research commissions were set up. The Sietka MO, relating to the orders of the Ministry of Defense and composed mainly of military personnel, and the Sietka AN, composed of the orders of the Academy of Sciences. The first group had the task of studying the military aspects of the problem, such as the possible influence of UFOs on the malfunctioning of appliances and systems while the second studied the scientifically and physically correlated effects of UFOs, trying to fully understand which causes and which consequences could have caused such demonstrations. The coordination of the first commission was entrusted to Colonel Boris Sokolov, that of the second commission to the physicist Vladimir Migulin, supported by Dr. Yuli Platov as his deputy coordinator. In Sietka's first reports, the sighting was referred to as the September 20th, 1977 phenomenon. Later, it became known as the Petrozavodsk phenomenon, although many have dubbed it the Petrozavodsk incident or even the Petrozavodsk miracle. From that day in the Soviet Union, the phrase unidentified flying object was replaced by the term anomalous phenomenon, a certainly more generic and less intuitive definition. In the reports from that night, we can glean a timeline of events that unraveled over a time span of more than five hours in the following ways. Most of the sightings, which occurred between 1 a.m. and 5.20 in the morning, involved about 48 reports of unidentified objects that would appear in the sky in a similar but almost never identical way. Several sightings occurred between 1 a.m. and 2.45 a.m. local time in the towns of Medvedyergorsk, Lorki and Kovdor and at 3 a.m. in the city of Palanga in Lithuania. From 3 a.m. to 3.25 a.m. an unidentified luminous object was observed by the supervisory staff of the Leningrad Sea Trade Port, now St. Petersburg while at 3.30 a.m. a flying object was seen by the crew of a fishing vessel, which was leaving from the port of Primorsk. In the written reports of the testimonies, the fishermen described the object as a balloon surrounded by a luminous cloak that moved without making any noise to the east, then abruptly changed course and headed north. Also around 3 in the morning, the phenomenon was sighted in neighbouring Scandinavia. 
In Helsinki, Finland, sightings of a luminous sphere were reported by national newspapers in the following days. The flying object was seen by many residents of the Finnish capital that night, including taxi drivers, police officials and airport staff. Moreover, the Ilta Sanomat newspaper also had reported a sighting that took place in the skies of Copenhagen, Denmark. The article reported the words of the pilots of a Finnair airliner returning from Rome. The two men observed a luminous sphere following their route, only for it to then shoot away into the sky. In St. Petersburg, then Leningrad, the sighting of an unidentified object was reported by three Pulkova Airport night shift employees, including air traffic controller Boris Blagirev, who at 3.55 a.m. allegedly spotted an object resembling a ball of fire to the northeast and with an azimuth of about 10 degrees. Boris described it as an object surrounded by a luminous aura, which rhythmically expanded and contracted through an intricate structure, and added that the observed phenomenon was nothing like the aurora. However, these UFOs were mainly traced to various places in the Soviet Union, especially in the Northwest, causing concern among the upper echelons of the Red Army. Throughout the night, luminous bodies capable of emitting rays of light or electric jets of bizarre shapes were reported hovering silently above the cities. The hundreds of eyewitnesses included paramedics, active police officers, sailors and longshoremen, members of the military, local airport personnel and even an amateur astronomer. Further reports came from different regions throughout that night. And so, as of December the 30th, 1978, Soviet researchers had collected a total of 85 reports on the Petrozavodsk phenomenon. Some of them came from important figures of Soviet society of the time. In the settlement of Kurkiorki, a luminous flying object attracted the attention of the engineer Alexander Novazilov, who compared it in size to an airship. Initially, the man saw what he thought was a meteor, but after some time, the object stopped and then moved towards him again, increasing in size and acquiring a well-defined shape, similar to that of an airship. According to his description, the object was faceted and had points of light on the front and back, while the edges shone with a slightly softer white light. The facets resembled windows lit from within and glowed uniformly with a white light that was dimmer than the edges. It moved at an altitude of 500 meters and was approximately 100 meters long, with an estimated diameter between 12 and 15 meters. The engineer also reported that the object was approaching his home when from its rear it released a ball of light that flew north to land in the nearby forest. The landing of this ball of light would have caused a glow to appear that was so bright it was visible through the trees. Another detailed account of an unidentified object was provided by Soviet writer and philosopher Yuri Linik, who observed the UFO at his country house near Namoyevo at about three in the morning through an amateur telescope. This is what he wrote about that night. The lens-like object, surrounded by a dim, translucent ring, was the color of a dark amethyst, intensely lighted from within. The edges of the object had 16 nozzle-like points that emitted beams of pulsating red light. Finally, it is also interesting to observe the evidence reported by several planes in transit in Soviet airspace. The crew of a Tupolev 154 of the Aeroflot airline spotted a luminous spherical aircraft at an altitude of 12 kilometers. It was also observed for half an hour by the Georgian writer Guram Panzikidze and other passengers on a plane returning from Singapore to Moscow at an altitude of about 11 kilometers at around 4.30 or 5 in the morning. But the epicenter of these activities was undoubtedly the city of Petrozavodsk, 
which, in addition to being the capital of Karelia, was at the time an important industrial centre of the Soviet Socialist Republic, with a population of 200,000 inhabitants. The first published report on the Petrozavodsk phenomenon was written by the correspondent of the Soviet Information Agency, TAS for short, Nikolai Milov, who described the unidentified object over the city as a huge star, which blazed up in the dark sky at around 4 a.m. local time. It would have started to send impulsive beams of light to the earth, illuminating the city as if it were day. Following the preliminary analyses and testimonies of citizens, Professor Milov, coordinator of Sietka AN, stated that the star was spreading over the city. It had the shape of a jellyfish, flooding the city with a multitude of very fine rays of light, similar to a pouring rain of energy. Milov also reported that a few minutes after the beginning of the phenomenon, the luminescent rays ceased and the jellyfish would have turned into a luminous semicircle, resuming its movement towards Lake Onega. The object, surrounded by a translucent cloak, was initially sighted around 4 a.m. in the northeastern part of the sky, moving towards Ursa Major at an azimuth of about 40 degrees. The initial luminosity observable from the ground was apparently comparable to that of Venus. The course angle, determined by ex-pilot and eyewitness Viktor Barkatov, was 240 degrees, and as it continued its ascent, it expanded and pulsated, without, however, demonstrating a decrease in brightness. According to Barkatov, the object moved slowly for about three minutes, and just before stopping over the city, it ejected a bright, oval-shaped cloud. Intrigued by these statements, Felix Ziegel, a well-known researcher and professor of cosmology at the University of Moscow, also became interested in the phenomenon, and he went to Karelia to interview the eyewitness Andrei Akimov. From the man's words, Ziegel concluded that the diameter of the phenomenon would have been about 105 meters, and that the object was red in color and it emitted a bluish-white glow, while the illumination of the area was compared to that of a full moon. The glowing cloud would then develop a dark spot around the central core that expanded rapidly as the glow slowly faded. The object hovered over Petrozavodsk for five minutes and then moved away at the angular velocity of a passenger plane. Finally, according to Akimov, the whole phenomenon lasted about 10 to 15 minutes. Following Ziegel's involvement, many others began to take an interest in the phenomenon, especially in the scientific community, which, however, strongly questioned the veracity of these stories. So, in November 1977, clinical psychologist Yalina Andreyeva evaluated the mental condition of nine eyewitnesses and came to the following conclusions. One can be sure of the complete sanity of the eyewitnesses and the veracity of their answers and testimony. Furthermore, several studies have found a certain impact of the phenomenon on the environment. According to Yuri Linick, after September 20th, 1977, increased biological activity occurred in the areas where the object had been observed. In particular, he reported the early flowering of roses in his garden, and the second flowering, in a year, of about 10 species of herbaceous plants, which he described as extraordinary. Indeed, for the latitude of Karelia after the autumn equinox, the flowering of these plants is almost impossible. He then underlined the intense presence of Anchistrodesmus algae in the waters of the Ukshodziero lake, probably caused by the radioactivity produced by the mysterious UFO. From a technological point of view, however, the engineers in the Petrosavosk area noticed huge failures in the computer devices during the passage of the globe of light, only to then regain normal performance. While the unidentified objects above the airports of Helsinki, Bulkava and Pesky were never detected by radar. But the most amazing fact is that the objects were not even detected by the Soviet air defence system. 
The initial analysis of the phenomenon was made by the researcher of the Sternberg Astronomical Institute, Liev Gindelis, using various testimonies and meteorological data available by September 30th, 1977. He wrote that an object's passage at a reasonably high altitude, allowing for simultaneous observations from all reported locations, is plausible at a flight altitude of about 100 kilometers or more. Gindelis noted that in that case, the minimum linear dimensions of the luminous spherical object should have been about one kilometer, while the diameter of the mantle several tens of kilometers. Considering the launch of Cosmos 955 as a possible cause, Gindelis outlined several obstacles related to this hypothesis, such as the westward movement of the unidentified object. Cosmos 955 was launched to the northeast. Also, the theoretical dimensions of the two differed. The Cosmos 955 suggestion was also criticized by Felix Siegel, pointing out that spacecraft are launched eastward, in the direction of Earth's rotation, and never the other way around. Furthermore, in 1977, Gindelis worked together with the physicists Mienkov and Pietrovskaya of the National Research Nuclear University of Moscow. They prepared a preliminary report on the Petrozavosk phenomenon, using the various data available as of October 20th, 1977, but the results were inconclusive, that is, without a certain explanation. Assuming that the extent of the phenomenon is apparently too great to be explained by technical experiments on the orbits of satellites, the report hypothesized a possible influence of some cosmic agent. This report was later used during the meeting dedicated to the Petrozavosk phenomenon, organized on November 1, 1977, at the Institute of Space Studies of the Soviet Academy of Sciences, but even here no one was able to formulate a rational explanation on the extent of the event. In late January 1978, Soviet researchers compiled an appendix to the 1977 preliminary report, which contained updated data emphasizing that sightings of non-identified objects elsewhere were reported prior to the launch of Cosmos 955. A copy of the paper was received by the French research group JEPAN. This copy was later forwarded to KUFOS, or the Center for UFO Studies in Evanston, Illinois, USA, and noted ufologist Joseph Allen Hynek presented another copy to NASA scientist Richard Haynes, who then translated the report into English with a government grant. The Soviet report was met with a mixed reception in the West. Haynes, Hynek and others publicly claimed that the report was key evidence for the existence of unidentified flying objects. While some criticism related to this admission was given by the engineer James Oberg, the main expert on the Soviet space program in the United States. Oberg criticized the Soviet investigation, considering it a ploy to divert attention from the Soviet Air Force's testing of new experimental aircraft. However, over time, various proposals have been advanced to explain the nature of the phenomenon. In the USSR, however, the director of the Pulkova Observatory, Vladimir Krat, initially thought that it was caused by the fall of a meteorite, while years later he attributed the phenomenon to auroras, an opinion also supported by the director of the Institute of Terrestrial Magnetism, Vladimir Migulin. Migulin and Krat's explanation was rejected by Felix Siegel, since auroras cannot occur at an altitude lower than 100 kilometers and that their surface luminosity is low, being incomparable to that of the Petrozavosk object. Subsequently, Migulin suggested that the phenomenon occurred due to a rare concurrence of various circumstances, namely the launch of the Cosmos 955 satellite, the strong magnetic perturbation due to the solar flare, and a scientific experiment to influence the ionosphere with radio waves at low frequency. Then, James Oberg put a stop to this myriad of explanations. 
he attributed the object's identity to the launch of the Soviet satellite Cosmos 955 from the Plesetsk Cosmodrome on September the 20th at about 3.58 local time. For him, Cosmos 955 was launched in a northeasterly direction and the residents of Petrozavosk watched the flame trail from the satellite's boosters. Oberg's point of view was then endorsed by the upper echelons of the Soviet government and found great support, notably from Yuli Platov in 1984. According to Platov, the appearance of a bright spot was associated with the glow of the satellite's engine. The formation of a large bright area reportedly coincided with the satellite's exit from the Earth's shadow. Similar phenomena as a result of satellite launches near sunrise or sunset have been reported several times since the Petrozavost incident. Platov further linked the development of the radiant structure to the passage of Cosmos 955 through the limit of the turbopause, above which the dispersion of combustion products takes place without the damping effect of the atmosphere. In short, a thickening of the aircraft's exhaust gases, which gathered around it when the propulsion became more intense. In 1985, Platov's point of view was also accepted by the Soviet scientific community. Moreover, the following year, Platov added that a number of additional effects which accompanied the Petrozavosk phenomenon were associated with the unsuccessful test launch of a ballistic missile, conducted in the same region almost simultaneously. However, Soviet investigators, following Platov's words, did not continue to research the phenomenon, leaving a totally incomplete investigation in the eyes of the people. To date, the Cosmos 955 argument remains disputed as evidenced by the words of Oleg Prus, who, referring to his 18-year service experience at the Kasputin Yar Cosmodrome, stated, I know firsthand the spectacle that occurs in the sky during rocket launches. It's quite an impressive sight. However, there was something completely different about the Petrozavosk phenomenon. For years, the upper echelons of the Union considered UFOs as a mere sensationalist invention of the United States of America. An attempt of misdirection by the Washington government, implemented with the ultimate aim of diverting the attention of the masses from the testing of experimental military aircraft. For them, the trick seemed simple. To pass modern war vehicles as spaceships, so that eyewitnesses would be transformed in everybody's eyes into weirdos, too obsessed with science fiction films and magazines, and therefore as people not to be taken seriously. This belief by the upper ranks of the party led to a complete reluctance to study UFO phenomena, at least until some brave Soviet citizens began to report their experiences of sightings in the skies. But to get to this point, it took a long time, and a less totalitarian government. At the beginning, the reaction of the authorities was a total denial of the phenomena. For example, the Moscow Planetarium used to send a response letter to witnesses of UFO activity. This letter, sent in standard format, carried the following words. Dear comrade, what you have observed is nothing more than an experiment with the aim of measuring the density of the atmosphere at high altitudes with the aid of a sodium cloud. Another example of the veil of silence over UFO activity in the skies over the Soviet republics can also be found in the words of many state officials. Soviet citizens are not like Americans. They do not see mysterious objects in the sky. And even if they did, we are sure that science can give a logical and terrestrial explanation to the phenomena. This was the official explanation of the party during the 1950s. However, today we know for sure that already at the time there was a certain interest in the study of such sightings inside the palaces of power, often mistaken for American spy planes or foreign aircraft seen as potential dangers for military defense. 
It was only after Stalin's death that information about UFOs began to be collected in the country. The first real scholar in the sector was Yuri Fomin, who, by presenting his studies, created a lot of interest in public opinion, which the party wasn't happy with, and for this reason, he was silenced. He was also discredited thanks to an article in Pravda, the main information newspaper of the country, which, regarding his words, simply wrote, These things called flying objects simply do not exist. Once more, the UFO phenomenon was relegated to mere reveries by American science fiction magazines, and Fomin's readings were banned by scientific research institutes. Thus he became the first true martyr of extraterrestrial research beyond the Iron Curtain. Only after Stalin's death in 1954, thanks to de-Stalinization, a policy designed to eradicate the personality cult of the Georgian dictator, and in general to lighten the repressive system of the previous years, that people began to speak more freely about UFO phenomena. In 1964, a Russian translation of the book Flying Saucers was published. It was the first book about UFOs translated into Russian. But the situation began to change radically only in 1966, when the young Vladimir Rubtsov published a first article which treated the UFO phenomenon as worthy of serious consideration. His article appeared in the Ukrainian language magazine Knowledge and Work. In the article, eyewitnesses were urged to come forward, and so hundreds of them sent letters where they reported in detail what they had seen. Silver discs, luminous aircraft, and globes of light. Here, for the first time, the citizens could freely talk about what passed over their homes in the skies. Some letters even spoke of sightings that occurred at the beginning of the 20th century, that had remained confined to their families for decades, as simple anecdotes that grandparents shared with their families in front of the fireplace. However, it was only after Petro Zavost that the UFO phenomenon was considered a subject worthy of serious investigation, and so top Soviet officials began an extensive program for the study of so-called anomalous phenomena. As we touched upon before, the program consisted of two parts, one civilian and the other military. Sietka AN, standing for AS Network, was a civilian study on the physical nature and mechanisms of development of atmospheric and spatial anomalous phenomena. Its main office was the USSR Institute of Earth Magnetism, Ionosphere and Radio Wave Propagation, called the IZMIRAN or ISMIRAN. Sietka MO, which stands for MOD Network, was a military study of anomalous atmospheric and space phenomena and their effects on the performance of military hardware and personnel status. Its main organization was at the Anti-Aircraft Defense Institute, located in Mitishki, near Moscow. Both parts of this program were linked through the Military Industrial Commission. All of their activities were secret for three precise reasons the need to ensure mitigation of the public response, proximity to defense-related topics, and the possibility that, in case of successful completion of the tasks, some discoveries could be used for military purposes. The State Committee of the USSR Council of Ministers on Hydrometeorology took an active part in this program from 1979. All Soviet meteorological stations and field study personnel received instructions and lengthy questionnaires about the so-called anomalous phenomena cited during the years of service. In 1980, government UFO censorship rules were changed, giving Sietka enormous power over public opinion, since by then all articles, books and television programs had to have an additional stamp of approval from the authorities of Sietka AN. Publishing any pro-UFO article was still impossible, as such articles had no chance of going through a double censorship. But despite the new censorships imposed by the regime, as is often the case, 
in the early 1980s, the number of UFO enthusiasts increased significantly. In Moscow, Leningrad, Kiev, Kharkiv and elsewhere, various scientific and technical societies and journals began to organize public groups for the investigation of anomalous phenomena. In 1981, the first ufological meeting on Ukrainian soil was held in Kiev, where 12 doctors of sciences and 40 candidates of sciences took part. The resolution of the Kiev meeting stated that, in the atmosphere, in the hydrosphere, on the Earth's surface and even in near space, a vast group of complicated phenomena are constantly observed by physical instruments and visually, which defy simple explanation as well-known natural phenomena or are due to human technological activities. This group of phenomena, referred to as anomalous phenomena in the environment, must be studied thoroughly in the interests of science and the practical activities of human society. In February 1984, with the consent of Sietka, recently renamed the Galaxy Program, all scientifically oriented UFO enthusiasts united in the Commission on Anomalous Phenomena of the Committee on Environmental Protection Problems of the Council of the Union of Technical Scientific Societies. The Commission set itself the task of collecting and analysing reports from witnesses of anomalous aerial activities and studying them in the places where they had occurred. The chairman of this commission was the USSR corresponding member, Professor Troitsky, head of the Gorky Commission for AP Studies. News related to the sightings appeared in the major Soviet newspapers. Sovietskaya Rasiya, Itsvieskaya, Socialistischeskaya Industria and Trud, even providing a postal address to which UFO witnesses could send letters relating to their sightings. Finally, during Perestroika in 1989, all UFO censorship restrictions were violated. In the Soviet press, there immediately appeared many articles on topics that had remained secret or accounts of incredible and often very fanciful encounters with creatures from Mars or other mysterious planets of the Milky Way. Since 1990, new magazines and newspapers have appeared entirely devoted to UFOs and paranormal phenomena. The most famous of them is the newspaper Anomalia from St. Petersburg, which has been active for over 30 years. Although the first major Soviet UFO research program was shut down in 1991, after the collapse of the USSR on December the 25th of the same year, some participants continued to work with UFO reports, albeit at a low level. In particular, the so-called AP Research Group within Izmiran, which conducted research for another five years before disbanding due to poor finances caused by the economic crisis that gripped Russia in the 1990s. All the ex sietka archives are still intact, but have been lying for more than 20 years in the basement of the Izmiran Institute. The Izmiran Research Institute is still active, and intends to carry out different spatial studies, such as the COMPASS program, a study on orbital magnetoplasma for the understanding and prediction of possible earthquakes on our planet. The Interheliodzond program, a long-term study currently frozen for unknown reasons and which aimed to carry out, thanks to a space probe, research at a distance of between 40 and 50 million kilometers from the sun on active solar phenomena, the solar corona, the wind, the polar regions of this star and all of those areas of the Sun not visible from the Earth. Intercosmos 19 or Cosmos 1809, a completed research experiment which aimed to observe the Earth's ionospheric structure and the electromagnetic processes associated with it. Project Pronios the conception of a series of satellites capable of analysing magnetic fields and the APEX project, a series of experiments on active plasma. Some of these experiments could not only guarantee the safety of our planet, but knowing in depth how the space that surrounds us works, 
technology will be able to bear new fruit and in a directly proportional way it will be possible for us to fully understand all those phenomena that until today appear unknown, generating new theories and probably also giving us new perspectives regarding our passage on this planet. The universe is a fractal mirror from micro to macro. Only by fully understanding it will it be possible for us to find the answers we seek in ourselves. Only by understanding it will we give an answer to the questions about who we are, where we come from, but above all, are we truly alone in the universe? The Veronish Incident This last case is certainly the most particular and is more reminiscent of a coming-of-age film for children than a classic case of a meeting with an extraterrestrial creature. It happened in Veronish and has entered Russian popular culture as a story of mystery, capable of eliciting a few smiles from fans of ufology and not only. In 1989, in Voronezh, a town located approximately 300 miles south of Moscow, an event occurred that upset the lives of its inhabitants, in particular those of a dozen children. An alleged UFO sighting linked to a close encounter with an extraterrestrial creature. Named the Voronezh UFO incident, it was one of the most intriguing stories of alien sightings and contacts in the 20th century. This merit is given by its immediate global resonance precisely because the promoter of the first publication was in fact the official Soviet press agency, TASS, one of the most authoritative newspapers of the time. In fact, TASS issued a statement that left the world breathless. A huge flying saucer would allegedly have flown over the city park of Varonish for days, even landing among a multitude of astonished children. On October the 4th, 1989, Vladimir Lyebyedev, Varonish correspondent for TASS, reported the landing of a UFO in the Soviet city a week earlier, that is, on September the 27th. The agency did not immediately disclose the news of the sighting, but Lyebyedev sent a news report on October the 9th, stating that some scientists had confirmed the landing of the aircraft. The next day, TASS released the news, and its communique created astonishment around the world. In Varonish, on the evening of the 27th of September at 6.30 p.m., a group made up of about 10 boys, all aged between 11 and 16, left school to find themselves in a city park in the suburbs with the intention of having fun playing football. But they could never have imagined that evening they would meet visitors from another planet. Once they arrived at the park, they saw a strange red light shining in the sky, and shortly afterwards, a deep red-coloured sphere, about 10 metres in diameter, appeared. The object began to circle the park, under the astonished gaze of the children. Once its reconnaissance tour was completed, it began its descent, towards the ground, and its colour gradually changed, becoming darker and darker. The sphere stopped, suspended in midair, about four meters above the ground, remaining motionless for a few moments. Without warning, the object quickly flew up and then completed its descent and finally landed in front of the amazed group of children. They saw a hatch open in the lower part of the luminous sphere and an extraterrestrial came out of it. It was a humanoid about 10 feet tall clad in silver overalls and bronze-coloured boots, with a disc on its chest. Its head was small, neckless and had three black eyes. Among them, the central eye moved like a radar, analysing all the surrounding territory. Together with the humanoid, a small robot also emerged and undisturbed, they strolled through the city park. Petrified by the unexpected visit, the Veronish children didn't move, except for one of the boys, who cried out in fear. Immediately, the eyes of the humanoid identified the boy and became more and more bright. 
The child found himself unable to move. A strange force had petrified him. The others, for fear of ending up like their friend, didn't move, and the strange being climbed back into its sphere together with the small robot. The two took off into the sky, disappearing into the clouds. However, the being returned after five minutes. The sphere with the humanoid on board descended once again into the park. This time, the humanoid was holding a tube about 50 centimeters long, which it pointed at another 16-year-old boy. It was a kind of weapon from which a beam of light came out and hit the boy, making him disappear into thin air. The humanoid climbed back into its ship once more and took off into the sky, but this time forever. Panic quickly spread between the boys, but a few minutes later, the boy hit by the ray reappeared in the same place from which he had disappeared, without remembering anything of what had happened, while the other boy also quickly regained the ability to move. The news of the landing spread quickly throughout the city, and after hearing about the incident, the head of TASS, Lyebyedev, interviewed the boys. The newspapers disclosed only the names of three of the group who were present that day. Shortly afterwards, the names of a large number of local witnesses were disclosed, including a group of adults waiting for the bus at a bus stop near the park. All the testimonies collected, both from the group of adolescents and from the adults, had many points in common. The statements of Lieutenant Sergei Mayetviev of the Voronish District Police Station stated that he saw the landing of the UFO on September the 27th, 1989, commenting, it wasn't an optical illusion. He later explained that he had not witnessed the aliens landing in the park firsthand, but only that he had sighted a bizarre spacecraft. According to his words, it was certainly a body flying in the sky, moving silently at very high speed and a very low altitude. He also said that he was a bit skeptical when he first sighted the object. I thought I was really tired, but I rubbed my eyes and it didn't go away. Then I thought, nowadays, everything is possible. Days later, Dr. Gienrich Silanov, director of the Voronish Geophysical Laboratory, told the TAS correspondent that he had located the landing site using a biolocation method and that he had found a circular depression on the spot with four deep holes arranged in a cross and two pieces of unidentified red rock. The journalist A. S. Bulanchev of the TASS agency later gave the news that an anomalous level of radioactivity, an intense magnetic field and fragments of the isotope cesium-133 had been found at the site. Moreover, the depressions on the ground seemed to belong to the probable landing gear and could have been caused by an object weighing a few tons. Professor Stanislav Kadmensky responsible for the scientific research carried out to establish what had happened, declared that the object that landed in the park did not look anything like a device of terrestrial origin, such as a helicopter or an airplane. While the Sovietskaya Kultura newspaper correspondent from Varonish stated that the stories of the boys did not present contradictions and the witnesses still appeared frightened. Some of the boys even made numerous drawings describing their experience with the two mysterious creatures. The news of the sighting was also published by Western newspapers. In the following days, different versions appeared. Some newspapers reported that the UFO was not spherical, but was more like a disc or a vertical cigar. While the newspaper Youth of Estonia, in an article written by its correspondent, reported that after the descent of the humanoid and the robot, two other humanoids would have made a brief appearance. However, some aspects of the case also left several ufologists perplexed. They noticed in the boy's story the presence of fantastic elements often present in science fiction films, such as robots, ray weapons and people who vanish. The strangeness of the case led ufologists, journalists and scientists to investigate and thus they became aware of a particular detail. 
it was ascertained that Dr. Silanov was not a scientist, but a ufologist, and that the structure he directed was a private laboratory. Furthermore, the biolocation method he had used was none other than dowsing, a paranormal technique. Silanov himself denied that the red stones he found were of an unknown nature. They were simply pieces of hematite. But for the ufologist, the other information reported by Tass was not that originally communicated by him. Thus, other witnesses of the sighting were sought, and only the mother of one of the boys was found, who reported having seen a red and yellow light above the roofs of the houses while she was at a family party. The lack of other witnesses seemed strange, because the area around the park was densely populated and surrounded by numerous public housing buildings. The citizens waiting for the bus were found. They confirmed that they had seen the UFO, but indicated different dates between the 21st and the 26th of September. In the following days, there were several other UFO sightings in the city. Reporters tried to trace the boys, but state television couldn't get close to them due to a ban by the families. Subsequently, the correspondents of the Maskovsky and Navosti newspaper went to the scene. There must have been only a dozen witnesses, but the boys who presented themselves to the journalists at the park were in greater numbers, and all of them said they had witnessed the sighting and declared themselves willing to be interviewed. TASS was the object of much criticism, and while defending its work, it admitted that there may have been some exaggeration in its statement. In turn, the journalist Lieb Yedev stated that it was possible that some of the adults had added details to the boy's story. The Scientific Commission of the Soviet Union ordered an official inquiry to study the case. On October the 28th, the France Press Agency published the news that a commission, headed by the deputy rector of the University of Varonish, Igor Sarochev, had conducted an investigation on the site of the alleged landing without finding anything significant. There were no anomalous levels of radiation, only a slight increase that could be explained by the Chernobyl accident that had occurred a few years earlier. No magnetic anomaly was found and the depressions on the ground didn't have the characteristics that could suggest the landing of an extraterrestrial vehicle. In practice, the elements supporting the sighting were reduced to the testimonies of the boys, and this led the Russian ufologist Boris Shurinov to declare that the Varonish case collapsed like a house of cards, and the journalists who went to the scene found themselves face to face with kids eager to be interviewed and were ready to declare themselves witnesses. Shurinov further explained that the symbol of the planet Ummo similar to the letter Tze of the Cyrillic alphabet, is present in the drawing of one of the boys. But the boy had never been present with the others at the time of the sighting. The boy had reproduced the symbol seen in a photo that an inhabitant of Varonish had shown him, which depicted a UFO sighted in 1967 in Spain. However, the Russian ufologist did not know that the photo, following more in-depth analysis, had been deemed to have been modified. Even if the Varonish case comes out downsized compared to the initial news of it, ufologists still found that in 1989 numerous UFO sightings were reported in the Soviet Union, including some landings followed by close encounters with humanoids. The Varonish incident, despite all its strangeness, and the chaos that it generated in the city remains one of the most unique and amusing close encounter events that have occurred since the post-war period, and thus concludes our journey of exploration of extraterrestrial phenomena in the territory of the USSR. The three stories we have told demonstrate the vastness of ufological activity in the ex-Soviet Union, a land whose secrets and mysteries, even today, we know very little about. In any case, in the Kremlin archives, there are still thousands of classified documents, pages and pages of witness testimonies, which, 
if ever revealed, would constitute an El Dorado for ufologists and enthusiasts of the sector.